Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out. We are really excited to have a special speaker today, Dr. Cooper. Um, I'm just here to welcome you all, and I'm going to let uh, Dr. Walji come up and, and give the introduction of our speaker. I just wanted to say welcome, and there will be a reception afterwards, so please come meet our speaker, talk about um, issues and health policy. We'd love to have everybody stay and stick around. So Dr. Walji. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's uh, great to see everybody this afternoon, and we're really excited to welcome Dr. Zara Cooper as our speaker this afternoon. So uh, Dr. Cooper is an acute care and trauma surgeon. She's in practice at Brigham and Women's, and she also serves as the Kessel Director for the Center for Surgery and Public Health. Um, she is a nationally renowned expert on the intersection between palliative care and trauma surgery. Um, she has um, She serves as an associate professor for surgery in the Harvard Medical School System, an associate faculty at the Ariad at Ariadne Labs, and an adjunct faculty at the Marcus Institute for Aging Research, all in Boston. She's a graduate of the Mount Sinai School of Medicine, and she completed her general surgery residency and critical care fellowship at Brigham and Women's, Brigham and Women's Hospitals and her trauma fellowship at Harborview in Seattle. So we're really excited for her talk today, which will explore um, the aspe aspects of health services research and how we can improve the quality of care for our patients um, with palliative care and uh, traumatic injuries. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you, um, and I, I do want to say that it is a true honor to be here. John Anian uh, was actually somebody who got me started in my research career, uh, and I'm forever in his debt and really excited to be uh, here today. Um, and for there, were, I had the pleasure of presenting at CHOP uh, just just a few moments ago, and uh, the the um, framework is a little different. Some of the content is similar. Um, what I will say is that I hope that with this group we can have a discussion. Um, please feel free to interrupt me. I think that um, a lot of issues come up when we talk about palliative care and surgery, and so I think a dialogue is very worthwhile. So thank you very much. Um, these are my disclosures. I think the key points for today um, that I'd like you to take away from this is that palliative care should be delivered at any stage of serious illness, uh, that high quality care includes palliative care, and that surgeons should be held accountable for palliative care in our seriously ill patients. Um, so as Dr. Walji mentioned, I'm a trauma surgeon, um, and I went into trauma because of this. Um, I like uh, kind of rescuing people from the clutches of death, and I like, um, you know, kind of adrenaline, and I like the emergency room, and I like the chaos, and, you know, I went into this to take care of, of, of um, young patients who got into trouble and to get them out of it. Um, but, you know, I didn't realize necessarily that when I finished my training that I was actually going to be um, entering medicine at the time of a major demographic shift in our country, and that more and more of the patients that I was going to take care of were actually going to be older adults who had falls. Um, and other um, blunt uh, kind of low impact mechanisms that had dire consequences because of geriatric syndromes and things with which I was really not familiar as a surgeon. Um, and uh, I came to palliative care actually through the ethics literature. Um, as a critical care fellow, I was really quite torn um, with um, some of the gaps that I saw in communication, some of the gaps that I saw in symptom management um, for our critically ill patients uh, of all ages, actually, not just our older patients, um, and ultimately decided to do um, kind of a, a sabbatical and a mini fellowship before I took my hospice and palliative medicine boards in 2012, really to, to hone my clinical skills. Um, but it was there that I realized two um, things. One was that um, as I was doing my rotations as a palliative care fellow on our oncology service, I was surprised to see that the average age of our census on the trauma service was actually higher than on the oncology service and that some of the syndromes that I was seeing in our oncology patients like frailty and cachexia were highly prevalent in our trauma patients. And so it was very clear to me that there was a lot of overlap between our populations. And then the other thing was that this is where I really developed kind of my passion for palliative care and really wanting to work to integrate palliative processes of care into routine surgical delivery and thought that really the best way for me to do that was to generate the evidence. 
um, to create the evidence base to support that. And so it's really through my passion in palliative care that I um, decided to become a researcher. And John Anian um, was very supportive and was actually my mentor in my first uh, grant that I got from the NIH um, and was very, very instrumental. And so I, as I said, I will ever for, forever be in his debt around that. The, the purpose of palliative care, contrary to what many people believe, is actually to help patients live as well as possible for as long as possible. Palliative care, although it grew out of the hospice movement, is not intended um, solely for end-of-life care. And in fact, there are you know, eight domains of palliative care, which include physical care, spiritual care, psychological care, social care, ethics. Um, and end-of-life care is actually only one of those domains. Uh, and so palliative care can be delivered for patients who have serious illness uh, really in any phase. And I think one of the things that we need to keep in mind is what is serious illness? So serious illness, this is a consensus definition that has been adopted by the National Consensus Guidelines uh, for Palliative Care and also uh, adopted by the National Academy of Medicine's um, uh, recent uh, uh, work group on dying in America, that serious illness is a health condition that carries a high risk of mortality and either negatively impacts a person's daily function or quality of life or excessively strains their caregivers. And for health policy researchers, how does that differ from high cost, high needs, multimorbidity, over you know, 75, vulnerable elders? How does it differ? And I think the importance here is that it really um, tries to incorporate the psychosocial domains of serious illness and recognizes there, that there are treatment burdens associated with uh, serious in illness in a way that uh, often administrative data can't capture. Um, and so that's one of the challenges of doing research in palliative care is really trying to do that. Now, you know, as a surgeon, caring for these patients is particularly difficult because, you know, my, my colleague Gretchen Schwarzy has done a lot of work on this about the communication um, that happens during deliberations about surgery. And, and, you know, as a surgeon, I think about things anatomically. Right? So if there's a hole, I can patch it, I can plug it. If there's a bypass, if there's a, a blockage, I can bypass it, I can cut it out. I mean, this is how I think about disease, but the issue is that my patients come to me with illness and that's how they experience their disease. Um, and that recognizing the context of how um, our patients come to us and what they experience is critically important in helping to make some of those decisions. And this can pose ethical and logistical challenges and system challenges um, for all of us at all phases. I think one of the things to keep in mind again is not that this is just related to end of life care, but that this is important in any stage of serious illness because um, you know, a cancer diagnosis is a life changing event at that moment. You know, and at that moment, somebody has, um, you know, psychosocial and spiritual needs. It becomes an existential crisis, and not acknowledging that, not uh, recognizing that that's part of what you're dealing with when you're patching or plugging or bypassing, is really to minimize um, kind of the the patient, the personhood of the patient and the family. Um, and so, uh, thinking about how to think about this in the context of surgery um, is quite challenging. So I want to introduce you to, to three of the patients that I've taken care of as I, as I owned up you know, in, my, in my recent talk. You know, these are all photos that I got from Google, but all of these are composites of, of patients that I've, that I've cared for and um, you know, lessons that I've learned that I want to share with you. So this first patient is uh, named Ramon, and he's a 71-year-old man who has advanced lung cancer. He's on his third line of chemotherapy. And for those of you who aren't clinicians, that means that he's receiving palliative chemotherapy. Um, and in his case, you know, he had uh, bony mets, he had brain mets, he was getting um, steroids to help manage his bone pain. Uh, in the weeks prior to meeting me in the emergency department, he was becoming increasingly debilitated, um, largely homebound, even bedbound. He was having episodes of, of coughing up blood um, that his family was reluctant to tell um, his oncologist because they were worried that they would stop giving him chemotherapy. And so he came to me because, you know, uh, folks who are on high dose steroids are at very risk of having bowel perforations. Uh, and I often joke that because I work at Brigham Women's, which is the hospital for Dana-Farber Cancer Center, I'm a surgical oncologist in the middle of the night. And so I meet remote at 2 a.m. and he's got, <clears throat> you know, mental status changes and he's an extremist because um, he's really quite ill with intra-abdominal sepsis from this. And, you know, the question becomes, what's the conversation? I can fix the hole. But this man has been rapidly declining, and his prognosis is really measured in, in weeks at best. Um, and I can't stop that. 
You know, and so what's what's the conversation that happens, and how do we think about Ramona? And I think one of the challenges is, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. I at this point I hadn't done my palliative care fellowship, and I really didn't know what to say. And you know, a lot of my colleagues would say, you know, you never know if somebody's going to live or die, so you operate on everybody, right? Um, and so it wasn't really really clear kind of what to do. And so you know, we looked at some of the data, and we actually did some uh, work using Medicare claims to look at. Um, uh, survival for older adults, and then we also use Medicare claims to look at survival um, after emergency laparotomy, for example, for patients who met our definition of, of serious illness. And, and we found that for the sickest patients, for the oldest patients, you know, one year mortality approached about 50%, but that most of the mortality was actually experienced in those first, you know, weeks to months after surgery. And that while most, you know, the, the highest slope of mortality was in the first 30 days, there was actually significant residual mortality between 30 days and six months. And so what does that mean? That means that, you know, the 30 day readmission, 30 day mortality, it doesn't really capture the patient experience. It's not an adequate outcome for determining, you know, what the impact is of what we do. Um, and one of the challenges, of course, is as I mentioned, we don't have a crystal ball. And you know, what is, how do surgeons make these decisions and what, how do they estimate prognosis? So we asked 24 acute care surgeons, it was a national sample, and we asked them, you know, if they had a patient like Ramon, we gave them this vignette, we conducted semi-structured interviews, and we said, you know, if you meet a patient like Ramon, what do you think the probability of death is within 72 hours without an operation? And I want to show you here on the... Um, y-axis is probability, and then we have the participant number, and it's kind of all over the place, you know? I mean, it's really kind of all over the place. So, you know, what's the lesson here? The lesson here is that the information that you get as a patient or a family member depends who's on call, right? I mean, that's a little scary, right? Um, you know, and, and that it, it really is highly variable. We then asked, you know, well, what do you think if Ramon does get an operation? What do you think his ex expected survival is? And again, on the y-axis, we go from days up to one year. You know, most surgeons were thinking that it was, you know, within months, you know. Most surgeons thought that it was less than 12 months. One person thought that he might survive a year. Other patients thought that, he, I mean, other folks only thought that he would survive days. Again, you know, the prognosis, prognostic information you get is highly variable, depends who's on call. But irrespective, you know, most of them thought that he was going to live less than six months. And so what does that mean? That means that Ramon would be eligible for hospice, right, even with surgery. And so the question is not, necess not necessarily whether or not to operate, but how can we make sure that Ramon is getting the best possible care, kind of no matter which way um, he, he's treated. Um, ag again, this was some of the Medicare data that we used um, to look at the high burden in palliative care needs in older adults um, who underwent emergent laparotomy like Ramon. I tried to use administrative data to characterize his experience. Um, we used um, this definition of high illness burden that it validated in patients who had hip fracture. It includes a number of variables, um, particular ones that I want to call to your attention. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, particularly around uh, f functional dependence, the number of helpers that they needed, um, high levels of comorbidities, high rates of healthcare use prior to surgery, and then there's this uh, component uh, of the Lee Index, which is a prognostic indicator for community dwelling elders, and it looks at your risk of death um, within four years. And what we found was that for patients who had high illness burden at baseline before they started surgery, before they came in for surgery, about 20% of them had a life expectancy um, that was uh, less than four years. Why does that matter? It matters because when I go back to what I was saying earlier about how does this compare to high cost, high need, how does this compare to um, older adults, you know, seriously ill patients, you know, most of them are not going to die within a year. Most of them are not going to die within a year, but these are patients who would benefit from palliative care, again, because they are dealing with the burdens and impairments of quality of life for themselves and also from their, their families. And so, um, here, if we look at, if we compare patients who have low illness burden in the blue and who have high illness burden in the red, you can see that the patients in the blue at the top, at one year, about 23% of them um, have died. Uh, and for the patients who have high illness burden, um, at one year, about 50% of them have died. And here, again, this shows that, you know, much of that mortality is experienced in the first six months. So um, recognizing that, you know, what we do impacts, I'm sorry, impacts uh, the kind of care that they deliver, that they receive. So, you know, one of the things that we did then was thinking, in thinking about Ramon, right, you're always challenged to um, uh, 
uh, study what you do. Um, in thinking about Ramon, how could we affect that conversation? How could we think about that conversation differently? And so we convened a panel of um, about 24 uh, leaders in palliative care and serious illness communication, anesthesia, critical care, geriatrics, um, uh, healthcare policy, healthcare implementation. And we created this framework um, for uh, communication for surgeons who are caring for seriously ill um, older patients who had acute surgical emergencies. A couple things I want to bring your attention to. The first thing that we suggested is that you connect, that you actually connect with the patient. And, um, you know, I was saying before, you know, my husband is an artist and he's horrified that, you know, my career is basically spent telling surgeons to talk to people. Um, but, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, is that most of the time, you know, 50% of the time, clinicians actually don't introduce themselves when they walk into the room and patients don't know who they are. And so just connecting with them, making eye contact, sitting down, uh, you know, all the stuff that we learned in medical school. <laughs> um, and then exploring their understanding. You know, so if I was thinking about a patient like Ramon, right, you know, so what's been going on these past few weeks? How have things been going? That's a very different, that's a very different um, opening to a conversation than, you have a problem that I can fix, right? How have you been doing? And what I hear is that he hasn't actually been doing all that well, you know, that he's, um, you know, been having decreasing function, he's been having this hemoptysis, he's incre increasingly weak. I mean, all of those things bode very poorly for a good surgical outcome, kind of irrespective of his cancer. And then, of course, there's the fact that, you know, now he's got this problem, he's not going to be able to receive any more palliative chemotherapy, he won't be able to receive any more steroids. This changes his treatments quite a bit. Um, and so, you know, kind of understanding the context in which you find yourselves, and then informing them about the acute problem uh, and how it changes things. Um, understanding their goals for care. You know, now that we have a shared understanding of how he's been doing, kind of where he is in the trajectory of his illness, you know, what are your goals now? You know, and I can't stress the importance of this because if somebody, you know, knock on wood, God forbid, were to say to me, you know, you only have, you know, a few weeks, a few months to live, it's great to be here, and I thank you so much for the invitation, and I want to go home now, <laughs> right? There are other things that I want to do with my time if it's limited. Right? And so helping patients understand, you don't have to give them percentages, you don't have to give them numbers, but helping them understand that that's a possibility, that that's a real possibility, that that's something that you're worried about, is incredibly important in helping set the context or the anchor for the conversation. Um, and then talking about options, including palliative options, making a recommendation, actually making a recommendation as opposed to saying to the patient and the family, okay, here's all the information that I have now, you decide what you want to do. Um, affirming the relationship and expressing support no matter what decisions are made, and then of course communicating and documenting the conversation with the clinical team. And so we tested this conversation with standardized patients and, and um, a purposive sample of acute care surgical attendings um, regionally in New England, and what did we find? That the surgeons were really good at informing and giving options. And then when we asked the patients what they valued the most, it was exploring the understanding um, uh, discussing goals, making recommendations, getting support of the clinical team. Uh, and so this is a disconnect, and we have to think about how to bridge this gap, right? And if, if I think about, you know, that National Academy of Medicine book, you know, crossing the quality chasm, like this is a quality chasm to me. This is a big problem and something that we need to think about addressing. This is Miriam, who is um, one of, one of, was one of the favorite patients I ever took care of. So she's an 85-year-old lady who had some mild cognitive impairment. She had known cervical stenosis, meaning that she had a known narrowing of her spine in her neck, um, which is very common. Patients often have um, you know, degenerative joint, joint disease, and she had never wanted surgery. She, she wanted, had no interest in it, even though it caused her a lot of neck pain. And she was at home cooking dinner for her boyfriend and tripped in her kitchen and hit uh, the kitchen counter with her chin. Uh, which unfortunately made her a C4 quad. And so she came to our, our trauma services as, as a brand new 85-year-old quadriplegic. She was taken to the operating room within 12 hours um, and you know, received a surgical fixation very quickly. She received state-of-the-art ICU care. Um, within three to four days, she had a tracheostomy, she had a peg, and was getting ready to go to, to a nursing home. Um, and, you know, she developed a DVT, but when we reviewed her as part of our regular trauma improvement process, you know, this was determined an anticipated complication without room for improvement. 
right? But if I were to present this, I am presenting this to people who aren't clinicians, they would be horrified. Like, really? There was no opportunity for improvement. You took an 85 year old lady, you took her to the operating room, you took her to the ICU, you gave her a trach and a peg, you sent her to her nursing home. There was never any discussion about her girls of care. There was no coaching for the family. Nobody asked about her advanced directives. Nobody managed her symptoms. Nobody addressed the psychosocial pain. Nobody offered her chaplaincy. I mean, I could go on, right? About all the room for improvement and about how palliative care is relevant in this setting. So, you know, one of the things that we looked at was, okay, well, what is the impact of, of palliative care potentially downstream um, for patients um, <clears throat> who are near the end of life? I will say that this patient died within uh, four months in the nursing home, and, and that's not unexpected uh, given the severity of her injury. So we looked at Medicare data. We used 100% Medicare claims from 2005 to 2011, um, and we took a cohort of older trauma patients um, and then we match them for patients who receive palliative care versus no palliative care in the hospital during their trauma admission and then were discharged. And we wanted to see what the impact was on the care that they received before they die. All of these patients were decedents who died within six months of their trauma. So again, you know, prospectively you wouldn't necessarily know that they were hospice eligible, but, but they were. And what we found was that when patients received palliative care in the hospital, um, they had lower rates of readmissions, lower rates of long-term uh, care facility admissions, lower rates of death in the institution, the palliative care, uh, the patients who received palliative care are in the orange. Um, again, lower rates of uh, ICU admission and lower rates of life-sustaining treatments. Now, what I can say is we can't really, we, we match them. We can't really um, uh, entirely rule out confounding by indication, even though we did propensity matching. But this is very consistent with other literature showing that inpatient palliative care can reduce downstream healthcare utilization. From a surgical standpoint, I think this is important because these are patients who are discharged, right? So this doesn't mean that palliative care meant end of life care in the hospital. It doesn't mean that the Grim Reaper came to take them away at that moment. It means that these were patients who discharged but there was an association between receiving palliative care in the hospital and having different types of care downstream. They all had the same outcome, they all died. But it is notable, of course, going back here, that only 2% of these patients received palliative care. So one of the things that's a challenge, particularly uh, if we wanna look at, at quality, is measurement. And so if you use Medicare claims to evaluate palliative care, what you find is that it's a terrible way to evaluate palliative care. It's poorly coded. The codes don't make any sense. Nobody uses them. Palliative care clinicians tend to bill for symptoms. They don't necessarily um, bill on palliative care. Palliative care can be delivered by all members of the clinical team um, and don't necessarily need to be billed by specialist palliative care clinicians. And so, you know, if I'm having a goals of care discussion as a surgeon, which I should be with my patient like Miriam or like Ramon, um, I'm not necessarily gonna bill for palliative care, I might bill for critical care time, for example. And so it's a terrible wait. So then how would we ever evaluate that it's happening? That, this was a question that was asked to us when we presented this data at Western Trauma. I'm a trauma surgeon, I'm pretty sure that I'm delivering palliative care all the time. How are you gonna capture it? And so what we did was we sought to describe palliative care delivery after moderate to severe trauma for all patients over the age of 18. We used uh, trauma registries of two major level one trauma centers in Boston. And then we used natural language processing um, to identify palliative care processes in, in uh, electronic health records. Um, and we compared the capture from administrative coding um, to natural language processing. And then we also looked at uh, rates of palliative care delivery. We included patients, as I said, who were over the age of 18, who were admitted to a trauma service, and who had an injury severity score of nine or greater, which means that they had moderate to severe injury. These are the administrative codes that we used. The palliative care process measures that we chose were goals of care discussions, clarifying code status, a consideration for a palliative care consult, and a hospice assessment. We chose these because these are accepted quality measures of palliative care in seriously ill patients. Um, and we also chose them because these are things that, you know, all clinicians caring for seriously ill patients should, should be able to do. This is not necessarily under the purview of a palliative care specialist. These are examples of some of the phrases that we uh, abstracted from the medical record. Our cohort, one of the things that I, I wanna point out to you is that we, our cohort included all patients over the age of 18 at two major level one trauma centers. Over 50% of the patients were over the age of 65. Um, that, you know, is reflective of a demographic shift. Um, that also means that surgeons have 
to get better at this stuff. There are more and more of our patients who are, who are nearing the end of life um, and who have multimorbidity and who have serious illness and have um, you know, decreased function, et cetera. Um, and then also this was a high uh, comorbidity group um, and there, this was a sick group as well. ISS score greater than uh, 15 means that 40% um, you know, of them were considered to be severely injured and AIS score uh, greater than three is a marker of traumatic brain injury and that's uh, moderate to severe traumatic brain injury. So this is a sick cohort of patients. And so what did we find? Uh, of tw almost uh, of over 2,100 encounters, we looked through 84,000 notes. Um, using natural language processing, and I will tell you that it took us about 20 minutes. It was much more efficient than doing chart review. <laughs> um, but what we found was that you know only 29% of these patients received any kind of palliative care that met this criteria. Um, you know, as it was pointed out in the discussion that we just had, I mean, only 6.3% of these patients received goals of care discussions. That's pretty. I mean, uh, 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 goals of care conversations. Only 27% had a clarification of their code status, which is pretty low. Um, being an optimist, I'd like to say that means that there's lots of room for improvement, and so I still will have a job. I still have things to do. Um, and then if we look at administrative coding, you know, administrative coding only captured about 7%. So if we're going to try and measure how palliative care is delivered, and this is not just in surgery, how palliative care is delivered in clinical medicine, then looking at administrative codes is not going to do the trick. We need to be creative. We need to look at using, um, you know, computer-assisted technology, et cetera. This is Elaine. Uh, Elaine is a 65-year-old woman who has advanced pancreatic cancer, um, and she is admitted to the hospital with a small bowel obstruction. She um, had a Whipple procedure approximately a year ago. She had a surveillance CT, which showed a partial small bowel obstruction a couple of weeks ago, and now she presents with a complete obstruction. Um, and we actually looked through medical records of patients presenting with malignant bowel obstruction um, at Mass General Hospital, and what we found was that 98% of patients with advanced cancer who presented with a malignant bowel obstruction at that hospital were seen by a surgeon. So even in the advanced stages of cancer, um, this is a surgical disease. Most of those patients did not receive surgery, but this is a surgical disease, which means that surgeons can influence um, the, the type of treatment that these patients receive. And so, you know, part of our question was, you know, well, does it really matter how they're treated? Uh, at their first visit. So we use Sumer Medicare data, and again, this was another look back study, which has its methodologic flaws, but this was another look back study um, where we looked at patients with malignant bowel obstruction who died prior to January 2013. We included patients with pancreatic or ovarian cancer. I'll say that over um, 50, 50 to 60% of patients with ovarian cancer will have malignant bowel obstruction. About 30% of patients with GI cancers will have malignant bowel obstruction. Um, and so we looked at those patients. Um, we looked at the first episode of malignant bowel obstruction, and then we looked at patients who had surgery. They received a venting gastrostomy tube, meaning they had a tube in their stomach that would um, release air so that, that they wouldn't have symptoms of nausea, or they would receive medical management. And we wanted to see what happened to not only their mortality, but what was the association with healthcare utilization downstream. We looked at hospice enrollment, uh, ICU uh, stay 30 days before death, death in an acute care hospital. What we found is that there are about uh, 3,200, 3,300 decedents. 61% um, of them were treated medically, 27% surgically, and 12% of them had a venting G tube. Uh, the median age was about 76 years. Most were female because of the predominance of ovarian cancer in the cohort. And so we did a, um, a survival analysis and we used Kaplan-Meier curves to look at, at survival. You can see on uh, the percentage of survival is on the y-axis and the time in months um, is on the x-axis. And what I want to draw your attention to is that 50% survival for the patients who had surgery with, um, which is in the solid black line here, is measured in months. That although the surgical patients survived longer than the patients who had medical management or received a G-tube, the survival is still measured in a few months. And so for those of you who aren't clinicians, I want to impress upon you that the way that Elaine looks is not uncommon, that this is how a patient will look during their first episode of malignant bowel obstruction, but her expected survival is measured in months. Um, and so we can fool ourselves and say, oh, well, she looks great, Right? And the clinicians here will hear, oh, they're walkie talkie or they have such a great sense of humor or they're really spry and somehow that means that they're not going to die ever. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is, is that because of her disease, 
her, her risk of mortality is still quite high. So we found here that the median survival was higher for surgery um, and lowest for venting G2. Now if we look at end-of-life care um, and how it differs by treatment, here we'll see that patients who had surgery had lower rates of hospice enrollment, had higher rates of ICU days in the last 30 days of life, and that patients who had venting gastrostomy had higher rates of hospice enrollment and lower rates of ICU in the last 30 days of life. And so I submit to you, what is the difference here? And I think the difference is the conversations that these folks are having. It's not necessarily, the, the, the outcome is, is not all that different, but it's the conversations. Now again, there's confounding by invocation. There are some patients who are gonna be amenable to surgery who won't be amenable to a, a gastrostomy because of anatomy or other things. But the point here is that there's a difference in the type of treatment that these patients are receiving. And the question is why? Right? If we were having the same, is the venting gastrostomy tube part of a bundle where there's then a conversation that says we should really start thinking about hospice? You know, we should be thinking about not going to the ICU, not being hospitalized, that the goal here is to focus on your symptoms and not necessarily uh, solely on prolonging your life. What, again, going back to the management issue, we then use natural language processing in a cohort of uh, patients who had advanced pancreatic cancer at Massachusetts General Hospital, and we used uh, natural language processing to identify these same processes of care in the electronic health record. And so we um, uh, did it for uh, about uh, 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 241 patients, um, and we reviewed uh, hundreds, uh, I'm sorry, thousands of notes. Um, and we used the same um, uh, definitions that I mentioned earlier, and we found that the sensitivity and specificity um, was actually quite high. But perhaps what was most remarkable, and you know, again, for those of you who aren't clinicians, you know, the expected survival for pancreatic cancer in older adults is incredibly low. Um, you know, median survival is about a year. Um, this is even after patients have you know successful um, Whipple operations or resections, um, and that these are all patients who had advanced cancer and they were coming for palliative procedures. We knew that they were towards the end of life. And we found that 13% of them had goals of care discussions, only 7% had code status discussions, only 10% had palliative care consultations, and 3% had, had um, conversations about hospice. Again, if we think back to the data that I just showed you, the information that they, the, these conversations in the hospital will affect their downstream care. These are opportunities that are missed for having goals of conversation and providing palliative care to these patients. One of the things that probably won't surprise you, um, but again shows room for improvement, is that if we look at the different types of clinicians who are caring for these patients, surgeons versus gastroenterologists versus interventional radiologists or other, um, the surgeons were the least likely to participate in any of these care processes. Again, a room, room for improvement uh, there. So one of the things that frustrates me as somebody who's passionate about integrating palliative processes in surgery is that I care, and I hope that maybe now you care, but you live a busy life, I live a busy life, and how are we gonna actually get this work done? And the reality is, is that you, know, you need a stick and not just a carrot um, to kind of move the needle, and we need to start really measuring how patients are receiving palliative care. We need to measure the effects and the outcomes related to palliative care, and we need to start benchmarking um, hospitals and health systems on how they're providing palliative care. National consensus guidelines state that seriously ill patients should receive palliative care concurrent to any stage of their serious illness, no matter which setting they find themselves, and that all providers who care for seriously ill patients should be able to provide some elements of palliative care. And so if we're going to hold ourselves to these standards, which have been endorsed by the American College of Surgeons, then we need to start measuring what we're doing. So we did an environmental scan of quality measures. We used these sources um, from the National Quality Forum all the way from NSQIP, and we looked for palliative care measures, surgical measures, measures that overlap, and then we identified palliative care measures that were potentially uh, adaptable to surgery. Um, and then we also looked at uh, palliative care measures that were related, that could be related to the surgical episode or end-of-life care. And we found that 123 palliative care measures, 643 surgical measures, 18 overlapping measures, and 71 that were potentially adaptable. We did a systematic review, um, and we came up with a suite of about 28 uh, potential quality indicators for palliative care and surgery. 
Examples of measures that are relevant for surgical palliative care, these are measures that overlap. So for example, the ACOF guidelines, which is for um, uh, vulnerable elders, you know, the percent of elder elderly patients with preoperative discussions of goals and treatment preferences. That's an, ex uh, an example of overlap. <clears throat> or the CAPS measure, which is a Medicare measure <clears throat> of communication, the patient experience with communication after surgery. If we look at measures that are potentially adaptable, ICU measures include the percent of ICU patients who have documentation of a family meeting. This is from the Care and Communication Bundle. Uh, the percentage of cancer patients who are screened for pain during a, an outpatient visit, a cancer-related outpatient visit. So this would be at a surgical oncology visit. Um, and the proportion of patients who die from cancer who are not admitted to hospice. And this is actually a nationally qualitative forum endorsed um, measure. And so you can see that this is how they would be, uh, could be integrated at various uh, phases of the surgical episode. And so very broad strokes, this is what it could look like. That in you know, the preoperative phase, there would be some goal setting. I mean, we actually have done data that um, is really, really embarrassing. We have a, a, a preoperative uh, testing center that sees over 25,000 patients a year. Um, and we found that 12% that of the patients that we surveyed in our preoperative testing center could not tell us what operation they were having. So having some goal setting <laughs> about what operation you're having or being able to name what operation you're having is probably pretty important. Um, doing a symptom assessment before surgery um, to understand how it relates to their symptoms after surgery, but also to um, alleviate their symptom burden um, is very important. Proxy, proxy designation, prognostication, and I will mention that, that all of these are actually currently in um, the geriatric surgery verification standards that have just been put forth by the American College of Surgeons. So some of this already exists. Um, in the post-operative setting, pain management, um, we think that we manage pain very well. Um, but we don't document it. We also don't document other aspects of pain, like spiritual pain and psychic pain, um, spiritual support, documentation of family meetings, uh, and then transitions of care around advanced care planning, uh, hospice assessment, and end-of-life care, and also uh, family, family support in that setting as well. So kind of very broadly, if we could integrate these processes, this is how it could look. So we uh, pulled together a Delphi panel of experts in surgery, anesthesia, palliative care, um, in quality measurement. We had representatives from the National Quality Forum there. Um, and we pulled together a panel to actually develop quality indicators in surgical palliative care. And this is under review, and some of you in the audience may be reviewing it, so be nice. Um, but the first thing that we had to do was actually um, figure out what the denominator was. You know, who are these seriously ill patients that we're talking about, right? Uh, and how does that differ from other, other definitions of serious illness that already exist? And so one example is that uh, current definitions of serious illness do not consider trauma. They do not consider tra traumatic brain injury. And that's something that's uniquely surgical within surgical purview um, and, and uh, should be included in surgical, uh, surgical serious illness. The other example that I have is that in um, most other definitions of serious illness, it includes very end stage liver disease, um, kind of pre-transplant. Um, but surgical patients who even have mild liver disease can become um, very ill very quickly. They can decompensate very quickly. And so you know, a lot of these goal setting kind of preoperative uh, uh, strategies are critically important in that setting, recognizing that it's dynamic. I think another example, particularly of the dynamism that's associated with surgery, is patients with end-stage renal disease, because we do transplants, and then they don't have end-stage renal disease. Um, nonetheless, they often come to us with a very high symptom burden. Um, their family needs a lot of support. Um, obviously, um, you know, a, a kidney transplant is a social event, and so obviously there are social and spiritual factors that are related to that. So those are just some examples of how a surgical definition might uh, differ from a medical definition. And this shows you that, you know, this was the pre preliminary definition that we came up with, and these were some of the changes that were made after we submitted that definition to our panel. I'm not going to bore you with the details, but this is um, examples of what some of these quality indicators might look like, and I know you can't read them, so I'll read them for you. But if we're, t for example, considering what um, quality surgical palliative care might look like in the preoperative evaluation and preparation, surgical deliberation should include a discussion of the following. So if a patient presents for surgical evaluation in the elective or non-elective setting um, for curative or palliative surgery, then there should be documentation of a discussion regarding the following or a reason why this was not discussed. The goals of surgery, the patient's prognosis, 
uh, the patient's priorities, values, and preferences, and then anticipated discharge location. And I will say that this is currently in the geriatric surgery verification standards. Um, and, and so this is a very different way of approaching a preoperative conversation, which is often focused on informed consent and discussing the risks and benefits of surgery. Right? And this is a much more participatory um, from the patient and their family. Another example is advanced directive. So if a patient presents for surgical evaluation in the elective setting or curative or palliative surgery, then there should be preoperative documentation of the presence, the presence I'm sorry, of advanced directive or a discussion about completing advanced directive if the patient does not have an existing one. There's another thing that I want to bring to your attention about these definitions is that they make a distinction between curative and palliative surgery. Currently, one of the major challenges that we have in surgical quality measurement is that this distinction does not exist. Right? And it becomes particularly problematic when we think about patients like Elaine, who have an expected mortality that's actually quite high. We know that. That's why we're operating on her. Right? But if we're measuring our success only by her mortality, we are destined to fail. Right? But if we start measuring our success based on her symptom burden and the alleviation of that symptom burden, then in fact we can succeed. And so further downstream, some of the um, uh, quality measures specifically deal with palliative surgery. The intraoperative event that you find that you go in to do a resection and you can't, you know, when should palliative care be called? Those kinds of things. So I want to thank um, my patients who have taught me so much and have given me the pleasure and the privilege of caring for them. And I also want to thank this long list and unfortunately not even entirely inclusive list of people who have helped me with all of this work. And I'd like to engage in a discussion. Thank you for your time. So we did mention that in the paper that you know one of the indicators, or, or that we should rethink that indicator. But I think the, the biggest issue is that there's actually no risk um, uh, risk modification for palliative versus curative surgery. And so uh, you know the foundation of that is we actually need to make the distinction between what's palliative and what's curative. I think that'll be highly challenging because you know kind of as I challenge my own field, I mean, like all of vascular surgery, as far as I'm concerned, is palliative, right? So um, I think that that will be a very interesting kind of paradigm shift. But I think also, um, you know, as I mentioned, one of the indicators is, you know, if you're doing a palliative pr procedure, then actually let's talk about symptom management. Let's document it. Let's figure out why we're doing it. What are the symptoms that we're trying to alleviate? So in the case of malignant bowel obstruction, it would be nausea, removal of NG2. You know, those are the things that are really important for these patients. Time at home, days at home. Let's document what the objectives are. And then, you know, let's revisit it and see whether or not we've achieved them in the hospital, but then also after discharge. I think you're right on the money about the, the curative versus palliative surgery because this is something that I've been on both sides of that equation, having done local procedures that were curative and observe the patient dying, uh, maybe with a life extension, but not, not, not uh, really cured. And, and, and we have this uh, illusion that we want to convince ourselves of as surgeons that we're always doing something curative, because for some reason, curative means it's better than palliative. And I think that gets to the core of the problem, is, is really rethinking what are the goals of, of, right. of therapy, yeah. whether it's surgical, medical, or anything else. Yeah. And, and how do we equate or, or put in a balance between whatever we think of as curative? And, and, and you know, the reality is that all of our patients die someday, even when they've been cured. Right. So. Right. I mean, no, don't, don't tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> as I wrote, 
Um, Hi, Julie. Recently. Great um, to see you. Sorry I came in late. No, thank I you for coming. I just want to ask you a slightly different question yeah. about um, how to change it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's clearly lots and lots of problems, but um, I've been thinking a lot with one of your colleagues, Rachel Bernanke, actually, mm -hmm. um, about the role of other team members. Yeah. So I had a wonderful exchange today as a primary care doctor, as a geriatrician, with uh, the surgical oncologist and the PA, yep. who is actually the provider who's been seeing this patient along with me. The surgical right. doctor has never even seen this patient, and the affiliation for this patient is with the PA right. in terms of the emotional connection and longitudinal yep. relationship. So I wonder your thoughts, because I view surgery as much more team-based, much more using PAs, uh -huh. nurse practitioners, particularly on the floor service, of the opportunities for really using not that changing the surgeon physician behavior is hard, but maybe there's an amenable group in our PAs and nurse practitioners who might be a target group for instituting some of those conversations. So thank you for bringing that up. And it's actually something that I neglected to mention in my talk. So there are a couple things there. One is that these quality indicators are meant for systems, not for specific surgeons. So Car and Chopper, we're not coming after you. We're coming after the hospital to make sure that as a, as a system, as an institution, these are the things that you're doing to promote team-based care. Um, and, and recognizing that surgeons can't do all of this by themselves, no, by themselves nor should they, um, and that this needs to be a team-based approach. The other thing that, and, and so that, that is part of um, the intention and also the documentation in um, these quality indicators, that they can be performed by any member of the team. It could be a PA, it could be a social worker in some cases, it's, it, it, it's just that it needs to be done. The other thing is that um, in the study that we did looking at um, uh, we, we did another study actually that I mentioned looking at um, using natural language processing to look at the delivery of palliative care among older trauma patients. Trauma is particularly team-based, um, particularly interdisciplinary in part because of how closely linked we are to the intensive care unit and the majority of palliative care is not delivered by the surgeons. Um, and so you're exactly right. And um, one of the ways that I uh, rethought the grant that we discussed was actually how to approach <laughs> that very question of how we can evaluate exactly who's doing who's doing it. I just it feels like culture change. Yes, can be pushed from many different directions. That's right. The people are doing the bedside care, not right. in the OR. That's exactly right. Are often most impacted by the terrible after effects of a surgery that maybe could have right. been avoided. Right. Right. And and you know I think that the um, this stresses the importance of the national consensus guideline that say that serious ill patients should be receiving this treatment no matter where they find themselves, right? So it shouldn't be that I have advanced cancer and I go to my oncologist and my oncologist is held to one set of standards because that's going to make my care better, but my surgery group is held to another. Um, but then also that, you know, all clinicians who are taking care of seriously ill patients, from chaplains to social workers to surgeons to anesthesiologists, should be able to approach some of this. So thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. It was great. So um, I'm another geriatrician in the room. Um, and my question was kind of in that team-based approach, um, or what are the efforts to also communicate what the surgeon is talking about or you know, knows to the other team members, like the primary care physician who could also help with some of these uh, difficult discussions who sometimes have better relationships, you know, more longitudinal relationships with these patients. Right. Um, Sometimes those discussions have been, you know, have happened, but they're not documented. Right. Um, so it's really difficult as a primary care doctor. So right. What are your thoughts? So my, my thoughts are, well, to answer your first question, what's happening very little, yeah. right? So there's very little actually happening to, to make that happen. Um, I was saying earlier today that, you know, in my next phase of, you know, next year I want to become an implementation scientist so I can figure that out. <laughs> um, but I, I think that one of the challenges with these indicators is that you know, most of them are process measures around documentation. So there are a couple things, right? Just like any kind of administrative data, you can only capture what's documented. Um, and so that's a limitation. But my hope is by benchmarking and measuring that more will be documented. Um, and so if it's documented, you know, then at least the information is out there. With respect to how to make it user friendly, that's that but but it's a huge it's a huge issue, right? I mean in our epic do you guys use Epic here? So in our epic there, there are two, there, there are four options for code status. One of them is full code presumed, 
which, I mean, shouldn't last more than 24 hours in almost anybody. And the other is cold last, meaning whatever they said last time, but the, all that shows up actually on the summary statement, on the summary sheet is cold last. You don't know what it actually was. So the way that we've configured our electronic health worker to communicate with each other, particularly about these sensitive issues, is really problematic. The other struggle, of course, is that, you know, if we go back to that quality indicator where the, the you know, preoperative deliberation should include those four domains, I and mean, how do we make it not just a checkbox? It's tough. So, thanks for coming and talking to us. I really appreciate it. Are there are the residents at the Brigham being taught this stuff from you? And so, I mean, because it, it really is the resident who shows up at the bedside in the middle of the night to have this conversation with the patient from Valper, right. who sets the tone. Yeah. Um, so, I try to, as much as I'm a plastic surgeon, but I get involved in teaching the, the general surgeon and stuff. And, um, I mean, do they get it just from you? Have you been able to have a culture shift at your institution? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, because I think it does really, the, our residents have been de-skilled to think that they're mere te technicians in, in some regards. And so how do you get to, to teach them that they need to really have these tough conversations instead of, I mean, maybe they think, oh wow, this is a tough conversation, I should call palliative care. Mm -hmm. But really, I think they need to be having the, the conversation, right? So right. how do we, what steps have you taken to implement this stuff with the resident? Yeah, so one of my favorite quotes from uh, one of my mentors is that slow, gentle pressure over time will change things that created the Grand Canyon. And so, um, you know, I've been there a long time. And so, yes, they do learn a lot of it from me. And because I'm a trauma surgeon, I touch all of them actually for very long periods of time in the middle of the night when <laughs> nobody else is around. Um, so I do have a very, you know, kind of unique experience with them, or then in the ICU. So yes, there, there's truth there. But I think it's also giving them skills to say, you know, instead of saying, you know, you're going to have surgery, you're going to die, from, you know, sometimes this is a problem that's treated with surgery. That's why we were called. You know, and calling for backup and not just having, blurting into the conversation themselves and trying to book the patient for the OR without talking to anybody about it first. I agree with you, they need to have the conversations. I find that the problem with um, the, uh, giving that um, responsibility to residents who are too junior is that they don't have the, con they don't have the context um, and they are particularly reticent to kind of make any decisions. And it's just unfair for them. They need to see it modeled for them. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I think most of my partners um, are, are in line with this. Um, our ICU is largely in line with this. It doesn't happen all the time, but I do think that there's been a culture shift. And I also think that within the field of palliative care, I mean, Dan can talk to this more than I can, but there are more and more places where one of me exists, you know, and you really need, you know, one champion. They have to be, you know, vociferous, but, you know, you need one champion to kind of try to push the envelope and just be consistent about it. Um, but, you know, it, it has been, it is, it is absolutely culture change, but then to your point, right, kind of culture change and wanting to do the right thing is not enough, which is why I'm working with the American College Surgeons to start measuring, right, because then everybody's going to get into line. Because all you need, you can have the most well-reading resident in the world, you can have the most well-meaning anything, and all you need is one person to come in and, like, just undo it all, you know, and kind of that conversation goes away. So I think that we need to start measuring it and people, holding people accountable for doing it well. And it's not just about communication. I mean, it's also about pain assessment. It's about making chaplaincy available. It's about recognizing that this is happening to the patient's family as well. It's about doing caregiver assessments because we're sending people home with tubes and drains and all of these crazy things that wouldn't have happened 10 years ago and just handing them over you know, to their spouse Without very, you know, without very robust support at all. So, you know, making sure that we're providing the supports to prevent the readmissions um, and all those things. Yes. Yeah, I know, Christian. I would say from the general, from the general surgery yeah. side, yeah. I would say it's un, it's totally unfair to hang the resident out alone. Yeah. And from the acute care side, I think that the attendees, the patients are complex, and the attendees are involved. And I think the important thing is that we learn to be as cool of a model as 
Thara is. And I know John Scott is, has joined us, right? So I think that there's a lot more at Amy Solana Ball focusing on more on that. So there's some hope, maybe. So I'm struck by your scenario about the patient that presents kind of in the middle of the night and those episodes where we're relying on you know making a decision in a quick period of time where social support may or may not be available, the family structure may or may not be available, the patient may or may not be able to communicate their wishes. So um, can you describe like sort of how these quality measures will intersect in those scenarios and the role of advanced directives um, yeah. and kind of how we think about it when we've got five minutes to make a decision, so yeah. to speak. So I guess, I guess one thing that I would say is that, um, you know, Gretchen Schwartz has done a lot around clinical momentum. Um, and a lot of the pressure that we feel to operate or the, the timeliness of operation is um, often about the availability of the operating room. Um, and that there really are very few scenarios that it's five minutes or nothing. Um, you know, most, even in our emergent, we have an hour which isn't perfect, but if we have enough time to get informed consent from a family member, we also have time to ask them if advanced directives exist. And so, you know, to some level, um, to some degree, I should say, I, I think it's, it's documenting, you know, advanced directives were sought, they weren't available, will be revisited in 24 hours. I mean, I think that would meet that indicator, but it says that it's our problem. We have to do it, and we have to pay attention to it, and we have to ask about it. Um, you know, I had a patient um, many years ago who um, was uh, coming from his cardiologist, he was an 81 year old man and he was coming from his cardiologist appointment, had a stroke and uh, ended up going the wrong way on the stairwell driving onto a car crash. And you know, it's Boston, right? So he had seven children, right? Three of them were lawyers, three of them were doctors and one was a judge and I am not making that up. <laughs> and so you know, and, and you see this highly functional family completely spin into all sorts of dysfunction in a very quick period of time. And nobody asked about advanced directors. We didn't ask about it. I didn't ask about it. And, you know, it turns out that on hospital day seven, while the guy is intubated and one of his daughters, who is a trauma surgeon, is like struggling with like, you know, what do we do about end of life care? What do we do about the ventilator? Somebody randomly said, didn't dad used to volunteer for a hospice? Do you think he's got a living will somewhere? And it turns out he had a living will that was 14 pages long. So if you don't ask, you don't know. And in the moment, they're not thinking about it, you know? And so I think that, you know, even, even in those moments, I think just asking about it um, is, is, is critically important. And then, you know, the, the quality measures, just like other quality indicators, allow for you know, or to document why you couldn't do it. But you have to be accountable for it. And I think that's the first step. You know, I, I hope that answers your question. But I think the first step is the accountability. It's just naming it and saying, you know, we own it. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.